Hello, I'm Rob, the host of Environmental Soup, and this is a recording from the radio show Environmental Soup through the facilities of Trunk Radio. This is uh, an interview with Bikes Executive Director focused on proposed changes to uh, bike lane legislation coming in October that haven't been uh, officially announced. I will be uh, playing the recording of that interview. Uh, there, there is no uh, video with that uh, file. Hello, my name is Rob, and you're listening to Environmental Soup through the facilities of Trent Radio. On today's episode, I will have an interview with Bikes Executive Director regarding proposal or potential proposal to restrict bike lanes. Here is the interview. Hi, I'm interviewing Mark Rommel uh, from Peterborough Bike on bikes thoughts on potential legislation around bike lanes. So I'll pass it to you, uh, Mark Rommel, uh, who is the executive director of Bike. Please introduce yourself, how you like to introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name is Mark Rommel. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the executive director of Bike, the Broke Community Bike Shop. Yeah, th thank you. I, I'm Rob. Uh, I use he and they pronouns. I know that this legislation hasn't been uh, formally introduced. Uh, those rumors of this uh, legislation being introduced, which will restrict uh, new bike lanes. Uh, those are CBC article. So I, I'm wondering what bikes uh, thoughts on th this potential proposal. Well, um, yeah, my take on this that it's not going to work. It could make congestion work. Uh, sorry, it could make it worse. Pardon me, trying to find a cheap win for his base. Uh, and uh, worse, it's a distraction from the other things that his administration is doing, like starving education, health care, and profiting off of the grift in relation to private development around the province. Uh, so I know that kind of covers a lot of ground, but we can just focus on the bike lane side of that. I just think it should uh, not go without saying those other things. So when it comes to bike lanes, uh, I have a lot of background in uh, my time in Toronto. Uh, I have a master's degree in urban planning. I worked for Cycle Toronto, which is a large advocacy organization in Toronto for about eight years. And so I'm, I guess you could call me a bit of a biased source here. Uh, but in my uh, professional and personal uh, assessment, uh, I've seen that bike lanes are good for business, that bike lanes are good for the environment, they're good for public health, they're good for personal health, uh, they give people more freedom and mobility, and that's people who are using mobility device, uh, a wide range of people, not just uh, able-bodied people on bicycles, and bicycle infrastructure can also help save lives uh, and reduce injuries, and that's across all modes, it's just not so... Uh, I have more to say about all of those things, but I don't know how you want to strain my <laughs> okay. Um Well, I, I don't want to uh, restrain your uh, perspectives uh, too much. I, I, I do have like half an hour um, for my um, radio show. I, d I did uh, have a question um, about like a comment made about saving lives. At a news conference um, on the 23rd, so a couple days ago, Ford made the claim that bike lanes impacted like emergency uh, service. I'm wondering if you have like comments on on that. And I did. And then on topic of like saving lives, I I read that like unfortunately like uh, six people have died uh, specifically in Toronto. Uh, I don't I don't know the numbers uh, for. The city of Peterborough, um, but uh, yeah, I'm w wondering if you can expand on on those points. Yeah, so 
I would point people to a CBC article that came out maybe in the last 24 hours, and it goes into fact-checking some of the claims made by the Premier. So they, this reporter was able to reach out to the city of Toronto, and the city of Toronto reported that there had been no complaints from uh, emergency service providers or hospitals about uh, delayed or impacts to service uh, in those corridors that had been mentioned. So, uh, and the reporter also goes in to provide response time data for sections of the corridor versus citywide uh, response time uh, over different periods. And uh, it appears that there is negligible, if not no impact. So I, I'd, I'd refer people to go to the CBC article because it's well-researched in the spirit of uh, fact-checking. Okay. Yeah, well, um, so thank you. So that's at least for the first part. And for the second part, yeah, with the six fatalities in Toronto, I think that fatalities are uh, probably the most grim statistic. Uh, I know in road safety circles, uh, they often talk about KSI, which is not only killed, but also seriously injured. Uh, and in my own professional uh, kind of advocacy lens, I also think about uh, less critical injuries and close calls. Um, as I myself has, have been a uh, experienced uh, minor injuries, but mostly close calls. So, but I've known people that have been seriously injured, and I've I've known people that have been killed. So I think that there are different approaches that people, uh, different stances on the question of safety that people take. Uh, some people really like to start with personal responsibility, uh, starting with the E, like. Uh, helmets and things like that, and that's really, the, that paradigm starts with the personal choice that people make about safety, and everything else kind of uh, becomes the background. There's another perspective that you can take on safety, and it is a systems design approach, very similar with a lot of public health uh, approaches on like, workplace safety or environmental safety, and so you start at the policy level. Uh, then there's the you know, then there's the protocols. What are the supports? What is the physical space design like? And then the very last line of defense in terms of safety is the PP. So if we're just relying on E to stop people from being killed and seriously injured, we have a failure of systems thinking, which will result in us not being able to prevent those deaths, serious injuries. Uh, and also, as we already out, if we have a safer system, uh, we're also going to have less minor injuries, less close calls, biking is going to be feeling more more accessible and approachable, and you're going to have more people choosing to walk, bike, and roll around and not fear for their lives in doing so. And I think that leads to more vibrant, sustainable, uh, connected communities. Thank, thank you, and I, I give uh, condolences uh, for the loss and hope uh, the people in Angel all uh, able to healthy uh, recover. Yeah, I would also uh, echo that sentence. Another question that I had is, like, a few years ago, uh, I think it was 2021, uh, the city of Peterborough voted to add bike lanes. Could potential restrictions on new bike lanes uh, end up canceling uh, existing plans? I don't know if all the bike lanes uh, that will approve uh, got ended up being built? Yeah, well, this we, we get into fairly complex and complicated territories uh, with this. There was a bike plan that was approved, uh, but oftentimes with bike plans, the bike plans are often different than the projects where the infrastructure itself is being built. The so bike plans are a process to consult with stakeholders and divisions of the city to come up with a vision, uh, but it is a far cry from actually building the thing. Uh, and as a, an old advocate colleague of mine would say, you can't ride on a plan. Um, I'll recall, keep quoting that over and over. So yeah, you can't ride on a plan. So far, we have a plan in place, but it's really unclear to me what the process for implementing new bike lanes on streets is going to look like. Uh, the city of Peterborough has been in really tough budget talks. There's a lot of competing priorities. Uh, there's large public uh, facilities going up, like arenas. There's talk about the airport. There's the police budget. Uh, and then where's the space? Oh, but also homelessness and addiction. Uh, and then where's the room for road safety and all of this? Uh, and so there was a pretty thorough public process about getting this bike plan. Um, 
And even before this announcement, it was kind of unclear about what the pace was going to be for these projects. And it's unclear to me what teeth this will have for municipalities. In some ways, it seems like a pretty large overreach. Um, and especially considering a lot of road improvements come from municipal tax bases. So what businesses... I, I understand that municipalities are, as they say, creatures of the province. Um, but there have been many other things that the province has deferred to municipalities about and why would their road... So yeah, I, I can't speak with any authority or certainty about how the... Uh, Peterborough's plans, but I'd be interested to hear from, you know, see the specifics of the legislation and reach out to city staff to get there. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we do, we do know that, like, this is, um, well, I, I should say that this hasn't been, like, officially announced, so it's just, um, based on repo reporting done by the CBC and it's one of stall that it, that we know about uh, this this potential new legislation. So, yeah, I, I appreciate that some of the details all aren't necessarily known. Yeah, and then you, you talked about um, uh, people being benefited that have uh, disabilities or don't use uh, bike lanes. I, I'm wondering if you expand on, on that, that you may. Well, yeah, I guess there's a bit of, uh, I'll, I'll untease that a little bit, because I will say that there is a, conception that everybody on a bike is an able-bodied person um, and I would say that the that's not completely true that the uh, collection of people that do ride bikes includes people with uh, various kinds of disabilities and visible disabilities uh, and some people use bicycles as an accessible repairable uh, affordable form of mobility uh, support uh, and so that exists in Peter Road, it exists in Toronto. So what I'm saying there is that you have people within the population, people that ride bikes, that are uh, living with a disability and that use a bike as part of their uh, life to navigate. Uh, so, and the other part of that is that, uh, so I think that, you know, designing bike infrastructure that is uh, usable by able-bodied and disabled people is important. So that has to do with connectivity, legibility, consistency, network design, all those things. So I think we should be designing bike lanes so that people with disabilities of a range of uh, a range of disabilities can be navigating that infrastructure while they're on bike. So that's kind of the first half. The second half is that there are people that are living with disabilities that can also use bike infrastructure. Um, I think this is already the case in places like Toronto, uh, but it's even more evident in other places uh, where the collaboration is uh, explicit, like in the, the Netherlands. Uh, so oftentimes sidewalks have a lot of seams in the concrete, and um, whereas bike lanes tend to be paved asphalt, there's a much smoother rolling surface, and often provides much better connectivity in some cases uh, with less obstructions than sidewalks because we have sandwich boards, trees, benches, things like that. And so it's quite common uh, for people in their wheelchairs or power chairs to be able to take advantage of the uh, smoother infrastructure that, although intended for bikes, can be used by uh, a range of people rolling, not strictly people on bikes. And especially if you take that infrastructure and then add a high level of service through all times of year, including snow clearing, uh, the difference between a cleared bike lane and uh, usually sidewalks are often left to the business owners on which the frontages above the sidewalk. Snow clearing can be really inconsistent. And then there's the windrows at intersections, which can be almost impassable. And that's, you know, Toronto, Peterborough, any place that has snow accumulation and sidewalks, it's big for accessibility. But if there's the infrastructure on the street and it's cleared properly, that would provide people with uh, different types of mobility devices aside from bicycles with another uh, connectivity option. I think that's worth, because it is, it's, it's, that's how it's, that's how it plays out in Norway and the Netherlands. So I think that's worth mentioning. Well, uh, th thank you for uh, highlighting highlighting uh, the benefits uh, for people with disabilities. I think that's an important comment. Include people with disabilities. So uh, yeah, yeah. You, I I know that you mentioned uh, your uh, experience in Toronto, and I know that Toronto and, and Peterborough might be di different based on geography and pop. I I'm wondering like. If you see, anticipate like similar concerns at Toronto and and with this potential, in terms of, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, 
so I think the situation in Toronto is that they have a few different streets where they're already exceeding capacity for motor vehicles, and uh, transit investment is really slow. Uh, so cycling infrastructure is one of the cheapest ways that you can add capacity to a road. Um, and there are some of these streets that just have uh, two lanes going in either way, and the proposals and some of these streets in Toronto uh, would be reducing the travel lanes. Well, it would still be two travel lanes, but one would be restricted for the use of bikes alone, uh, and that would have an impact on parking. So I think um, that there's usually a number of concerns that come out of that, uh, especially if that street isn't supported by transit, like a subway or an LRT or a high-frequency bus. So, um, yeah, and, and I think Toronto also has it has the very, uh, an east-west dynamic to the Flows. I mean, that's kind of an oversimplification, but because it is stretched along the lake near downtown, the, uh, going east or west is uh, a big part of getting around. Um, and so Peterborough generally just has a lot less density, a lot less density uh, of employment centers, less density for residential units. The downtown is also a lot less dense, tons of on-street parking. Uh, and uh, in that more urban part of Peterborough, like we already have uh, better than a lot of other towns of a similar size. Like we have uh, some mm-hmm. bike construction on Water Street, we have bike on George Street, we're looking at some on Charlotte Street, uh, Bethune is a wonderful piece of infrastructure that goes right through the downtown, uh, which is really a lot more than a lot of towns our size uh, could say. Uh, there's certainly room for improvement with that existing infrastructure. But, and I think that uh, what, imagining what infrastructure for biking looks like uh, as we move beyond the downtown part of like the town ward into the new developments, uh, especially into the really big uh, corridors, like what does cycling infrastructure look like around Lance? What does it look like around Shimong? Uh, especially in the climate of, um, yeah, I would say the transportation planning in Peterborough is not exactly, despite the existence of the bike lanes, like a lot of the, um, yeah, like they're, they're planning a widening of Shimong, uh, typically like road widening, uh, not exactly a cutting edge transportation planning strategy, uh, as opposed to, you know, road diets and investing in transit and other, other tools that you can put money towards. Uh, adding another lane has been tried for over half a century, and it only has short-term gains. So uh, the game of trying to add lanes uh, to get ourselves out of a, a congested future is so I think uh, it's unclear how well Peterborough will be able to uh, avoid committing the same dead-end strategy as the last plus years. Um, so uh, I think that's, yeah, Peterborough's dealing with a lot, uh, a bit of intensification, but a lot of new development on the outskirts, and it's unclear if they're actually going to build the people to bike uh, to the places they want to go. And when they arrive in those places like Shimong Lansdowne, then it's a safe place. So I think it's, 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 it's a bit grim uh, in terms of the future, but also uh, Peterborough is better than a lot of places already to ride. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of a not answer, but uh, yeah, I hope that's uh, yeah, that, that's that's okay. I I appreciate that. Yeah, and then I've been reading about like induced uh, demand. Uh, so I've I've seen the, uh, some of this uh, reporting that talks about like that that issue. Um, and then um, just today uh, when I'm recording this interview, I I've I've heard like in uh, Toronto. Um, that uh, there was a proposal to build uh, new lanes under the highway uh, 401. So yeah, um, I guess my my uh, I do have uh, two two questions. One is like uh, if you have anything that you would like to add, and then um, so my next question is about like um, protect protected uh, bike. I know that there was a push to see more protected bike. Bike, what are your thoughts on, on that? Or oh, is there enough protected bike? Yeah, okay, so I think uh, there, the David Suzuki Foundation did some really interesting polling a few years ago, and they polled people, if not across TA, I think it was just, um, but uh, I'm going to save you the, uh, the frantic searching. I didn't think I was going to pull this up. Uh, but it was almost three quarters of respondents. I mean, it was either 67 or 76. Uh, can't remember exactly, but I think it's one of those two. Uh, it was the people that would ride more often if they felt safer. 
Uh, and that's not just people downtown Toronto or downtown Peterborough. It's just people in general. Uh, so the main thing holding people back from riding a bike more often, and that's like if you don't ride a bike at all and might ride it once a year or ride a bike once a year and might ride it twice, you know, all those things are uh, huge leaps uh, for beginning to change behavior. Um, and the main barrier is that people don't feel like it's a safe thing to do. And having high-quality protected infrastructure is the best thing you can do to help people feel safer. Uh, that includes, you know, uh, and what I mean safe infrastructure, it's continuously safe. And what I mean by that is it's easy to make a safe uh, curbside lane on a, on a straightaway, but where most uh, incidents and collisions occur are in intersections. It is possible to create a protected intersection. It takes a bit more engineering and a bit more work, uh, but it's been done around the world, and they're starting to do it in Toronto, uh, and you can continue to have a higher degree of separation and improve safe outcomes uh, with different design. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for Peter Road because we don't have the same density because we don't have the same intensity of use, uh, we have a bit more space, uh, there's more room to fit that engineering. So uh, rather, than, uh, rather than being in a place like Toronto where the intensity is so high and the density is so, uh, just increases the pressure on all of these corridors and intersections so much that anytime there's any change, there's just so much more pain doing it. Uh, Peterborough has the pressure off. We are building new developments where we can have a different vision of what we want this stuff to be and just build it from day one. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a fight. It doesn't need to be a street fight where things get quite messy politically and socially um, in the city and in other communities. And uh, it doesn't need to be that way necessarily. We have some vision planning uh, foresight. Uh, so, uh, yes, so protected bike lanes, one of, uh, I'm not going to say the only way to build bike lanes, but it's certainly the uh, first choice um, so if I was going to add anything, uh, I'm really glad you brought up induced demands because uh, that's echoing my thing about adding capacity and trying to build our way out of the problem with more lanes. So I'm really grateful that uh, you're sharing that concept with your listeners and your audience. Uh, and it's a reminder that, uh, you know, when I drive in Toronto and I'm stuck on the DVP, it's not because there's a bike lane on Blue Street. It's because there's, you know, tens of thousands of other people probably also driving alone also on the DVP. And, uh, so if anything, why be pointing out bike lanes? Why isn't there an express bus to Oshawa? And why do we have only, you know, why can't we have better than 20 minute service on the Lakeshore East line? You know, so these are the types of things that will really get congestion uh, shifting. Also, they've been talking about a rail line to connect the, the major cities, Montreal through Peterborough to Toronto, uh, you know, decades kind of that promise that they pull off the shelf for the time of elections yes. coming up. Uh, but that, that would be transformational. Uh, and I've also found that large transit projects like that are often the best way to support cycling. Part of the reason we, there was a pilot project for bike lanes on Blue Street is because uh, the, the east-west travel was supported by major transit. So the demands on the roadway were alleviated by that transit, which meant there was more of a case to be made for surface surface area being dedicated for active modes like walking bike. So the more transit that can be built, uh, the less pressure we're, the less uh, performance we're expecting to be delivered with single occupant motor vehicles, and it creates more space for other modes uh, beyond transit as well. So I just want to do a shout out for major transit projects. I think we should all be calling for more transit projects as a way to help cycling. Um, and I think that I just want to say that uh, you know, creating these restrictions on removing travel, like motor vehicle uh, restrictions or bike infrastructure could make the congestion issue worse. Uh, maybe that almost goes without saying. But biking is one of the cheapest forms of transportation. The infrastructure to accommodate safe cycling is also one of the cheapest forms of infrastructure. When maintained properly, it can be done year-round. There are countries that do it year-round and that are snowy Nordic northern countries. Take a look at Finland, Oulu, the look at the mode share and how little that dips uh, in the winter months. And uh, if we are making the roads, so bicycles are entitled to use the road, their vehicle under the highway traffic stack. Ve uh, bicycles are currently allowed to use a full vehicle lane. Uh, we just create infrastructure to promote uh, the more uh, uh, widespread use of bicycles. So uh, removing bike lanes doesn't actually take 
it'll, it'll discourage people from riding and put more people into danger and not actually solve congestion because you still have cars in front of And I would just maybe put out there that uh, a lot of this maybe has to do with, uh, you know, this struck me as a petty, a, a petty announcement. Because uh, not only did Doug try and become the mayor of Toronto, uh, but failed. Uh, I think there's also a bit of vendetta for how the more progressive downtown parts of Toronto treated his brother when his brother was mayor. And now these bike lane proposals, they've been really built out in the downtown and now spreading into Mitotobico, which is the heartland of Ford country. And so now there are bike lanes being proposed on uh, Bloor West and the Queensway, kind of his front yard in a lot of ways. And there's definitely pressure for constituents in that part of Toronto to resist this stuff. Uh, and that is understandable somewhat. Nobody likes, uh, but I have a feeling that, uh, yeah, there's this move for his base and that it's going to drag a lot of other municipalities through the mud just to get a cheap win for for Tobacco. So I think that's, uh, that's another thing that I, and I hope that none of this is, you know, whether it's a tunnel under the 401 bike lanes on the Queensway, uh, I hope that people can keep the degradation of funding in healthcare, education, addiction, uh, all provincial responsibilities are also in mind. Think of what the legacy of the Ford government is. And we're not even the legacy, just the current expression of the thing about the legacy that's being built. And so I hope that the bike lane piece aren't going to be added on. Um, it's just very discouraging and adding it to the pile of discouraging and disappointing. Well, well thank Thank you uh, for uh, this interview. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I don't have any additional questions, uh, but um, I appreciate your time. I'll turn yeah, off maybe my... We, uh, yeah, if we could maybe leave it just uh, maybe on like a lighter note that bike lanes oh. are good for business. <laughs> bike yes. lanes are good for the environment. They're good for public and personal health. They give us freedom and mobility options and help save lives. So maybe that's my like mic drop thing rather than on <laughs> yes yeah it is, it is good to leave uh, on a positive note I, I, I appreciate that um, yeah well th thank you for uh, listening and uh, and enjoy the rest of your uh, week yeah thanks for this opportunity Robert and uh, good luck with the rest of your production so that concluded the interview I had with bikes executive director. Since then, there was an article in Canadian Cycling Magazine called Ontario Sports Minister Says Wearing Helmets Properly is More Important Than Bike Lanes. As we hold from Bikes Executive Director, infrastructure is important. The article um, in had, has a quote from Stephanie Kroll, director uh, at Parachute, which is a national injury prevention organization. Uh, the quote says, helmets are a crucial safety element when you're riding a bike or doing other activities. They are proven to prevent serious skull injuries and brain damage. However, there is no evidence that they prevent concussions. And... She said the best way to protect cyclists is through separation from cars. There's another quote. We know that bike lanes and infrastructure, especially protective lanes, help prevent collisions. I will be continuing to look at cycling news and news around this potential legislation it's expected later in October. So next week, I plan to look at uh, environmental rights for Lake Winnipeg. I saw that in the news, and I will also expand on uh, so my Social Bread series that I have, uh, which is uh, just on YouTube. Before I go, those three items on the environmental registry... They are proposed regulatory amendments to streamline the approvals process for alterations to municipally owned sewage and water distribution works that are part of transit projects. Uh, this has a number of 019-8728. 
uh, Wando, Provincial Park Management Plan Amendment, Cottage Lot Leases, this has memo 019-8289, and Proposed Amendment to Ontario Regulation 299-19, Additional Residential Units Made on Auto Planning Act, this has a memo 019-9210. If you're interested in any of those, you can comment on on them through the environmental registry. I hope that you have a good rest of your week, and I look forward to uh, hosting next week's environmental soup. And I will have additional videos on YouTube, and we'll post this on YouTube as well.